is a place in Venice Beach called California called Digital Domain. This is some of the, an example of an HLA a visualization and a synthetic natural environment, much like what I was working on and much like what I didn't want to support too much more. Instead, I wanted to support the dangers <laughs> of the governator. <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger, Terminator. Digital Domain had just finished doing Titanic. I'll tell you a little bit about that. I did not partake in the creation and rendering of Titanic. I just got to use some of the equipment, and that was very, very cool. I did get to participate in some films there. Uh, I came in at the end of What Dreams May Come, so I got to experience my first Academy Awards special effects Oscar party. Pretty mind-blowing, um, <laughs> just like the special effects. Got to help turn Terminator 2 into a 3D ride, if you will, at Universal Studios, T2 3D. That was very, very cool. Lots of very cool stuff. But today we're talking about the very cool hardware, the very cool software, the very cool things you can do with it. These happen to be representative of the silicon graphics beasts that we had at Digital Domain. The SGI, we had challenges that had 28 CPUs, uh, Onyx stations, monster reality nodes, and they're not cheap. SGIs are not something that you used to have in your home. Some of you these days may, and that's such a nice treat. But back then, you couldn't really afford to have those around. And when they started considering for Titanic the amount of rendering and processing power they would need if using entirely SGIs, they realized that, like Titanic, it wouldn't quite work. So Daryl Strauss, my software manager in charge of software development at Digital Domain, he and his mate Wook put together um, a few DEC Alpha CPUs. They had, in addition to the 350 SGIs sitting around, 200 DEC Alphas. A few of them were allocated towards Windows, that other operating system that was sitting across the street where they did TV commercials. Whereas in the main building, we used SGIs for the real films. Unix for film. Windows for TV. Question. Um, it's, a, it's a little fact that um, per second of film adds uh, much, much more expensive. So, well, maybe not more expensive, but um, a little bit more profitable. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ads in films are much more expensive. Yep. Um, I realize I think time is already halfway through. So I'll just <laughs> uh, that's Daryl Strauss right there. And that is a sneak peek into the render farm that he put together. Okay. Hundred and five deck alphas running four hundred and thirty three megahertz CPUs each. Whopping four hundred and thirty three megahertz. And back up a page just to remind you the rest of all this. 100 megabits per second. We did have a hippie network in there, so there were some pretty fast connections. Um, but that's a lot of machines and five terabytes of disk space. At the time, that was a lot of disk space. Now you can get terabytes in Dick Smith. <laughs> it's just carry terabytes, terabytes around in your pocket. Um, there were lots of issues that Daryl and Wook ran into in putting together this render farm. I won't go into all of them. Um, in fact, I won't go into much except just to leave a couple quotes that talk about how they couldn't have done it without open source. Contrary to common sense to build the best secret proprietary software, because in Hollywood, every particular effect is secret. It's all proprietary. Digital Domain was brought in for their liquid metal to do so many music videos, Buster Rhymes, Janet Jackson. People wanted that liquid metal look when the Terminator melted away and came back. That's what they wanted. So it's not an open source effects system, but the need to have an open source technology behind it was very understood. So you need to have an open source platform underneath it. The reason is that proprietary software can require tweaks to the operating system itself that no proprietary operating system vendor would be interested in implementing. Sweet ass. With open source, Studios control programmers at anything, whether at the software or operating system level. And 
Linux got its big Hollywood break in 97 when Digital Domain used Linux to render the special effects for Titanic. And in 2003, this article goes on to say how now how easy it is that Sony even can install 100 Linux Intel Render Farm servers, have them up and running in an hour. That was then, and we've gotten even better. Even today, from one of their latest films, 2012, the quote is, it's been our experience that open source projects help a lot because typically in feature effects we end up needing to work very differently than the original intentions behind libraries. And that's what we all know here being an open source. We need to change things sometimes. We need to adapt them. And open source does give us that flexibility. Well, somehow there was a turn. Some, somehow I ended up from doing space and science fiction movies such as Supernova to actually working on science. And that was a treat as well. Um, inspired by some of the cluster work at Digital Domain and some of the render farming that we got to do in question. Thank you very much. The, the question, if I may, was that even though the effects systems may be proprietary, are there ever submissions back to the open source community of some changes? And I'm happy to say that Digital Domain does take pride in that. They do submit changes to open source graphics libraries, and they do make some of whatever they can available through GPL. Very good about that. Yes, thank you. Um, so right on to Mars at the Lunar and Planetary Lab in Tucson, Arizona, where I spent quite a few years working on a project based on the 2001 Mars Odyssey, a spacecraft that was launched in 2001 and is still to this day orbiting Mars and right now is listening for the heartbeat of the most recent Mars mission, the Mars Phoenix Lander, also launched by my same group was a part of that. It's been idle over the Martian winter because there hasn't been enough sun. And they don't expect it to be alive. But as the Odyssey is orbiting around, it's listening for a heartbeat as the sun comes over the Martian horizon to start bringing it to life again. So hopefully we'll start hearing some more science and data collection coming from that again. But it's probably dead. It was only allowed three months, or expected to be three months on the Martian surface. And it lasted five months, and then it went to winter. But we'll see what happens with that one. If time exists, which I don't expect, um, we've got about 10 minutes, six yes. minutes. <laughs> um, I've got a video I can show of the 2001 Mars Odyssey launch. Well, I'll just point it to you really quickly right there. There's the Odyssey as a spacecraft, still orbiting Mars, 3,010 days out now. That's the spacecraft itself. My team worked on the gamma ray spectrometer which was set out from the, the boom so that it didn't get any of the gamma rays from the spacecraft itself. We wanted to isolate that and just travel around the planet and watch what gamma rays are emitted from the planet. Now, I'm not a scientist who studied gamma rays. I'm not a geochemical expert of any sort. Um, but that's one of the beauty about technology, about working with computers like this, is that we can help scientists. We can help solve problems of many different natures of which we may not always know, but we certainly get to understand. I learned a lot about GRS at the time, and it's a tricky problem because it's a passive sensor that goes over, and it just detects all of the gamma rays that the standard galactic cosmic rays hit, spark a, a nuclear reaction, basically, as, as what happens on Earth. All the gamma rays are popping up around us. And you can't really say if you get one gamma ray where it's coming from, because they're all coming from different angles. So the next 70 slides that I'll try to go through in about <laughs> 70 seconds are from a presentation I gave in 2006 at the Moscow Space Research, Research Institute with our partners at ICI doing the high energy neutron detector. And this is about our MCNPX cluster. MCNPX, what's that acronym? There's so many acronyms around. 
Well, MCNPX itself is a Monte Carlo simulator. Monte Carlo in particle extended. And it's got all kinds of things that you can define, such as the geometry of the setup, um, how high up the spacecraft is from the surface, and how many surface depths we have, essentially mapping out what the soils are underneath a few meters below and the atmosphere above. And start defining things of what we think the chemicals are, what the chemical makeup of Mars, because Odyssey is trying to understand how Mars is made up, where the ice is, the frozen water, where the dry parts are, where the silicon is, where the iron is, all of these things that they can only tell <coughs> by reverse engineering the data that they've gotten. So we throw in models of what we think the system is doing, what we think is on the surface of Mars and below the surface, and then we run those into our simulation and start comparing. Does it match up? Where doesn't it match up? And all kinds of stuff goes into play. We look at the, the data, the area of interest we want, but this is essentially what's happening in the surface. A cosmic galactic ray comes down, hits neutrons in a something, and spatters something out to something else, and stuff comes out. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're watching for the things coming out. And they each have their own signatures and representations of the data. But to the scientists who are running the simulations, all they see are a whole bunch of cryptic input to the simulation and a whole bunch of really cryptic output. And my job was to help them make sense of it and help running simulations. So I'm going to go really quickly through the tools that I put together to make it make a little bit more sense using XML as input and CSVs as output and help generate the files that go into all of the science that really come into <laughs> calculating all this stuff to say if the spacecraft is here, what are all the places it's getting to? And remember being gamma rays and maybe not coming out as often, you have to go around the planet hundreds, thousands of times to start collecting enough data to really figure out what's in there. And Martian year is about two Earth years. So to get a year's worth of data, two Earth years, another two Earth years more, Here's where it gets into the parallel processing into the next five minutes. We started off taking our Monte Carlo simulation that took three hours on a PC to do 100,000 probabilistically oriented runs. Put these on to a cluster on our uh, local computing system, our computing center for the Polytechnic. And it had CPUs of 1, 4, 8, 16, 32, or 64, an alpha cluster. Um, but we ran into all kinds of problems with it. Essentially, each person was only allowed one job at a time, and it would kill the jobs after 24 hours, but we sometimes had batches of five weeks that we wanted to run, so how to put these into a system like there. Um, essentially, I, I created some self-monitoring, auto-relaunching scripts that watched what it was doing, figured out if there was enough time for the next thing to go, and so on. But ultimately, we had to build our own. It really had to be a system that we had control over for our own distributed simulations. And we could build something very cheap using, I love Oak Ridge's Beowulf style stone supercomputer. Bring any computer and it'll keep on growing. What we did, instead of going with either of those, was put out a bid, had another company that we said, we want 32 CPUs, basically. And we want them all powered by Linux. Who can do it? So we put a bid out there, got another company to do it, Aspen, Aspen Systems in Colorado, and this is the cluster that we ended up with. Now, one of my take-home lessons today is running Fedora Linux. Um, we had balanced the time that I had to work on a system like that to build it together myself versus all the other things that the scientists need. And we said, okay, if we have somebody else build it, it'll all be good, right? It doesn't always work like that, just like we're talking with open source. You've got to have control over it. And with some of the cluster management software that they had, it would do things like if a temperature spike was detected and it had to shut down, shutting down in five minutes, four minutes, three minutes, oops, five minutes, four minutes, five minutes, four minutes. What? <laughs> so we had a few changes to do. And I think I've got a couple minutes left. Um, ultimately, if you're designing and putting together your own system or using somebody else's, you are going to need the flexibility to get in there and make changes. You're going to have to have somebody who can help make changes, whether it's writing your own web-based job submissions or doing fixes in the kernel. 
um, specific things with MC and PX that we ran into is that the MPI that it was using was a little bit older. It was using an MPitch. I forget the version right now, and I don't have that in there. Um, but there were a few disconnect problems in the middle of the night when there were a few conflicts with stuff and stuff, and I'll talk to you more about that later if you'd like. But essentially, by having our own cluster, we were able to take a three-hour processing job down to five minutes to 10 minutes with 30 CPUs running at the same time. And there's some views of the cluster in action, some ideas about how to take a communication heavy system and re-parallelize it, redistribute it in a way that's much more efficient. You'll find every system has its little weaknesses and its holes and its bottlenecks. In some of this MC and PX, it's the communication, set up various job batches and so on. And whew, lots and lots of stuff. So that's Bill Boynton, my boss, who's still in charge of lots of fun rocket science at the University of Arizona, simply saying there's a lot of water there. <laughs> and NASA's philosophy is to follow the water. It leads to human exploration in space, space and so many wonderful things, so I did. <laughs> Living in the desert of Arizona, studying the dry Martian planet, I really need some ocean back in my life. And I saw this Tyrafiti Polytechnic ad sitting on this image, this image right here. <laughs> That's the water I was going to follow, I said. And that was three years ago, and I'm so glad I'm here, and I would not turn back around at all. I love some of the research they've done, but in this conference this week, you get to hear about some open source space research we can do right here in New Zealand as well. Um, in the meantime, I've worked on an open source education project called EXC, sponsored by Tyrafiti Polytechnic, as well as Core Education, and started by um, the current Wiki Educator Projects man, Wayne McIntosh. If anybody you know him, he's from Otago. Many open source projects going on here in New Zealand. <sighs> Who's that guy? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So now I'm teaching computing full-time at the Polytechnic, and I'm teaching beginning programming, and I want to introduce these parallel programming concepts. I want to introduce distributed computing. I want to introduce high-performance computing. And the way I'm doing it right now is in a very casual Friday afternoon hacking session. <laughs> Good hat hacking, of course, but these are guys who are very motivated and not really confined to the curriculum. They don't want to do the set things. They've already done that. They want to do more, but they're in the polytechnic setting, so I want to give them environments and tools like what we've been talking about today to really get them going to the next level. And there are so many places throughout New Zealand where cluster computing, high-performance computing, and parallel computing are already going. We've got a great foothold here. Let's keep it going. Well done. And it was 100. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I met Remo about, I don't know, six months ago, but I never figured out that you were a showman, too. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions, gentlemen, ladies, people, computers? Yep. <laughs> no questions. Well done, Remo. Thank you very Thank much. You all. <laughs>